What if I told you that the Vikings survived Arctic nights at minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit without firewood and sometimes deliberately allowed their homes to fill with smoke just to stay warm? Long before electric blankets or oil-fired furnaces, the Norse world lived under a cold most of us will never truly know. Snowstorms could bury a house overnight. Wind-driven ice cut through wool and skin. Even breathing painted the air with pale clouds that vanished into darkness. In Scandinavia's far northern latitudes, winter wasn't a season, it was a power that ruled life for months. And firewood wasn't guaranteed. Tree lines thinned quickly as you moved north, forests grew sparse, and fuel became a guarded resource. A log wasn't cozy, it was time. Hours of warmth you might need later, when the storm returned harder, when the sun stayed low, when everything outside the walls turned lethal, burned too much too soon, and you didn't just lose comfort, you lost margin. In that world, warmth was a budget, and every family had to balance it. That is why Viking survival was never sentimental. It was engineering. Every choice, where to build, how to sleep, what to wear, what to eat, when to burn fuel, was a calculation against the cold waiting just beyond the door. They didn't simply endure winter and hope for spring. Over generations of trial and loss, they learned to manage winter like a system, turning scarcity into strategy and strategy into life. Once you grasp that, the question changes from how did they stand it to what did they design? Because in the Viking North, comfort was optional, planning was everything, and the cold punished every mistake. At the heart of Viking survival stood the longhouse, not as a place of comfort, but as a calculated response to cold. To modern eyes, it looks simple. Timber frames, packed earth, and a roof of grass. But that simplicity hides a deeper truth. A Viking longhouse was a thermal system designed to trap, slow, and preserve heat when fuel was scarce and winter showed no mercy. The walls were not thin planks. They were thick layers of turf and sod, stacked tightly together. Earth changes temperature slowly, absorbing warmth when it was available and releasing it back into the room long after the fire burned low. The roof followed the same logic. Covered in heavy sod, sometimes nearly two feet thick, it acted like a massive insulating blanket. Snow piling on top only improved the effect, sealing heat inside while the world outside froze solid. Even the air was engineered. Most longhouses had no chimney, not because Vikings lacked knowledge, but because they understood the cost. Chimneys pull warm air out too fast. Instead, smoke escaped slowly through small roof openings, allowing heat to linger, radiate, and warm everything it touched, beams, walls, and people alike. The air stayed hazy, but it stayed warm. This was not accidental warmth. It was deliberate design, refined over generations. The longhouse did not defeat winter with fire alone. It slowed the cold, stretched warmth, and turned earth and air into protection. What appears primitive today was, in reality, a quiet triumph of survival engineering, built not for comfort, but for endurance. At the heart of the Viking longhouse, fire was important, but it was never the only source of warmth. Just as vital was heat that lived and breathed alongside the family. Livestock were brought indoors not merely for food or protection, but because their bodies produced steady, reliable heat. Cows, sheep, goats, and sometimes horses shared the same roof, turning the longhouse into a living thermal system. This was a deliberate survival choice. A single cow, standing quietly in a draft-free corner, could release as much heat as a modern electric space heater. Sheep contributed in a different way. Their dense wool trapped warmth and released it slowly through the night, even in damp and freezing air. Together, these animals raised the base temperature of the house, reducing the amount of precious firewood needed just to stay alive. The structure of the longhouse amplified this effect. Animal stalls were often built slightly lower than the human living space. Warm air from the animals' bodies naturally rose upward, drifting towards sleeping benches while colder air settled near the floor. Without tools or technology, the Vikings used biology 
and gravity to move heat where it mattered most. To modern eyes, sharing space with livestock may seem uncomfortable, but comfort was never the goal. Survival was. In a world where fuel was limited and winter unforgiving, every warm body became part of the system. Heat was captured, shared, and reused. Life itself became energy, and that quiet exchange often meant the difference between enduring the night or never seeing morning. If you imagine Vikings gathered around roaring bonfires, like in Hollywood films, think again. In reality, fire in the Viking world was never about spectacle. Wood was too scarce and too valuable to burn fast. Instead, Viking hearths were designed for control. Fires burned low and slow, producing steady heat while consuming as little fuel as possible. Most hearths were shallow fire pits, carefully tended so embers smoldered for hours rather than flaring into open flames. The goal was endurance, not brightness. A controlled fire could warm a longhouse through the night without draining wood reserves needed for the weeks ahead. Every flame was deliberate, every ember was managed. One of the most effective techniques involved storing heat rather than feeding the fire. Vikings pulled smooth stones from the hottest part of the hearth, wrapped them in fur or animal skin, and placed them near sleeping areas. Heated well above the boiling point of water, these stones released warmth slowly through the night. Long after the fire dimmed, the stones continued to radiate heat like ancient thermal batteries silent, steady, and reliable. When wood ran low, Vikings adapted without hesitation. Peat cut from bogs and dried animal dung became common fuels, capable of smoldering for long periods without intense flames. To modern ears this may sound crude, but it was practical and efficient. This was not primitive living, it was calculated thermal management. Viking fires were not meant to impress, they were meant to last, and in winter, lasting was survival. Cold air sinks. The Vikings may not have described it in scientific terms, but they understood it through experience, and they built their nights around that truth. Sleeping directly on frozen ground was an invitation for the cold to drain heat from the body hour after hour, so they lifted themselves above it. Instead of beds placed on the floor, Viking longhouses used raised wooden sleeping platforms built along the walls. By elevating their bodies, sleepers moved away from the coldest layer of air and closer to the warmer air that naturally collected higher in the room. This small change made a measurable difference, especially during long winter nights when temperatures dropped well below freezing. These platforms were not bare wood. They were layered carefully with straw, animal hides, and sheets of birch bark. Each layer slowed the transfer of cold, creating insulated sleeping spaces that trapped body heat and reduced heat loss to the structure beneath. Once settled in, a sleeper's warmth stayed contained, turning each bed into a kind of thermal cocoon. In some longhouses, this strategy went even further. Lofted sleeping areas or attic-like platforms were built higher along the beams where the warmest air gathered beneath the roof. Smoke and heat rose together, and those who slept above benefited from both. It was the Viking equivalent of choosing the warmest room in the house. Sleep, for the Vikings, was never passive. Height mattered, placement mattered. By understanding how air moved and where warmth lingered, they transformed simple wooden platforms into one of their most effective defenses against the cold. Forget blankets. For the Vikings, warmth came from what they wore, not what they slept under. When night fell and fires burned low, they did not undress. They layered up. Clothing itself became their primary defense against the cold built to trap heat and keep it close to the body through endless winter nights. Wool formed the foundation of this system. Layered wool tunics, trousers, and undergarments created pockets of warm air that slowed heat loss. Unlike many modern fabrics, wool retained warmth even when damp, a crucial advantage in smoky, humid longhouses. Over these layers came fur linings and heavy cloaks, often made from thick sheepskin, the same garments that blocked wind and snow during the day became insulation during sleep. This method closely resembles what modern hikers call the onion system, 
adjusting layers to regulate body heat. The Vikings mastered it long before it had a name. Each layer could be added or removed as conditions changed, allowing warmth to be controlled without wasting energy or fuel. Feet were treated with equal care, wool socks were common, and when that wasn't enough, scraps of fabric stuffed with moss or straw were wrapped around the feet. These crude inserts worked as effective thermal barriers against frozen floors. Some outer garments were even made from seal skin, naturally waterproof and wind resistant, the Norse equivalent of a modern outer shell. In the Viking world, clothing was not fashion, it was infrastructure. Worn day and night, these layers turned the human body itself into a portable heat system, capable of surviving when nothing else could. Modern advice encourages light meals before sleep. The Vikings followed the opposite rule, because for them, food was not just nourishment, it was heat. On winter nights, meals were chosen to keep the body warm, long after the fire faded. Their cold season diet was heavy in fat, whale and seal blubber, oily fish, thick porridge soaked in animal fat, and bone broth rich with marrow were common. This was not indulgence. Fat provides more than twice the calories per gram compared to carbohydrates, and it releases energy slowly. As the body digests fat, it produces steady internal heat over many hours. This slow heat mattered most at night. When movement stopped and external warmth weakened, digestion became the body's furnace. A fat-rich evening meal helped maintain core temperature through the coldest hours, when hypothermia posed the greatest threat. Some families saved their richest foods specifically for nighttime. Knowing delayed warmth could mean survival. Bone broth played a key role. Warm, dense, and easy to consume, it delivered both calories and heat without strain. Even preserved foods, dried fish, fermented meat, stored butter were selected not just to last the winter, but to fuel warmth when nothing else could. This was not overeating. It was thermal strategy. When the room could not always be heated, the Vikings heated the body instead. Each meal became a controlled, internal fire, quiet, efficient, and essential. Human bodies generate heat. The Vikings may not have measured it in watts, but they understood its power. Each person gave off warmth, and in a Viking longhouse, that warmth was never wasted. Families slept together, children, adults, elders, all packed closely beneath layers of heavy furs and hides. The goal was simple. More bodies meant more heat. This arrangement created what modern science calls shared thermal mass. When bodies are close, heat loss slows. Warmth circulates instead of escaping. In the depths of winter, this collective heat could raise the temperature of a sleeping space enough to mean the difference between surviving the night or not. Sleeping alone was inefficient. Sleeping together was strategy. Beds were wide for a reason. Entire families shared raised platforms, wrapped tightly in animal skins that trapped warmth and blocked drafts. Each breath, each heartbeat added to the heat held beneath the furs. The longhouse itself became quieter at night, not just in sound, but in motion allowing warmth to settle and remain. Even animals played a role. Dogs curled beside their owners, not as pets in the modern sense, but as living heaters. Their bodies added warmth through the coldest hours, while their presence also served as protection. If predators or strangers approached in the storm, dogs would sense it first. In the Viking world, sleep was never solitary. Warmth came from proximity, from trust, from shared space. The family itself became a furnace, steady, reliable, and alive. When the wind screamed outside and the cold pressed in from every direction, Survival depended not on isolation, but on closeness. Surviving a Viking winter was never a matter of getting through a single cold night. It was a daily discipline, repeated hour after hour, storm after storm. Winter survival was a lifestyle one shaped by constant attention to how cold entered, moved, and settled inside the home. Draft prevention was taken seriously. Some longhouses were built with narrow entryways, or small antechambers that acted like buffers between the outside world and the living space, much like modern airlock doors. 
These features reduced sudden blasts of icy air and prevented precious warmth from escaping every time someone entered or left. Inside, the layout mattered just as much. Living and sleeping areas were arranged close to the hearth, while open spaces were minimized to keep heat concentrated where people gathered. Nothing was wasted. Straw, moss, animal hides, and scraps of fabric were reused again and again to seal cracks in walls, pack gaps in doors, and insulate floors against frozen ground. These materials might seem insignificant on their own, but together they formed a flexible, constantly adjusted barrier against the cold. When something shifted or wore down, it was repaired immediately. Letting heat leak was not an option. This attention extended beyond construction. Daily routines adapted to the season. Movement slowed. Activities clustered around warm zones. Tools, food, and supplies were stored where they would not freeze. Every choice reduced exposure and conserved energy. The Viking world was not designed for ease or comfort. It was designed for endurance. Winter was not an emergency, it was the environment. And survival depended on managing it not once, but every single day. The Vikings were not simply tough people shaped by cold, they were architects of survival. Long before modern insulation or climate science, they developed a practical understanding of how heat moved, how it was lost, and how it could be preserved. This knowledge was not theoretical. It was earned through lived experience, refined across generations that faced winter with no margin for error. The systems they created worked because they were connected. Longhouses trapped warmth, animals shared body heat, clothing functioned as wearable insulation, food fueled internal warmth. Families slept together, forming shared thermal mass. None of these elements mattered on their own. Their strength came from how they worked together, day after day, as a single survival strategy. Climate evidence suggests Viking era winters were harsh, marked by long freezes, violent storms, and sudden cold snaps. Yet families endured these conditions not by overpowering nature, but by adapting to it. Their homes slowed the cold instead of fighting it. Their fires were controlled, not dramatic. Their bodies, diets, and social bonds became part of the heating system itself. This is the real legacy of the Viking winter. Survival was not about heroics or brute strength. It was about restraint, efficiency, and understanding limits. That mastery did more than keep people alive. It created a society strong enough to build ships, cross dangerous seas, and reach lands others feared to approach. Winter did not break the Vikings. It prepared them. Next time you reach for that electric blanket or thermostat dial, consider the generations of people who lived without a single powered heat source and survived. What lessons might ancient ingenuity hold for our modern energy challenges? If finding strength in simplicity inspires you, there's more to explore about how past civilizations outsmarted the cold, and perhaps what we can learn from them today.